Uh, I am Kerry Liu. I currently work at WeWork. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so I'm at WeWork right now uh, as a senior data scientist. Um, I've been in the data game for like six years, six plus years so far. Um, trained in statistics, and then I realized at some point that you can get paid a lot more to be a data scientist for basically the same kind of work. Um, so that was like kind of my like come to Jesus moment, and I've been doing data science for four years now. Um, two at a successfully exited food tech startup, and uh, currently the last two years at WeWork. So I'm actually part of a team, um, pretty small team, five people, who uh, basically create data products at WeWork. So we kind of build the entire thing um, from start to finish. So we do like we have our own scheduler, we have like you know our own kind of like mini DevOps environments, and our main, I guess, like mandate is creating recommendation systems, um, as well as doing some NLP. So WeWork has been around for um, maybe nine years now, and for the first seven years of, ex of its existence, it's basically done two things, which is just grow and spend money. Um, but for the last two years, uh, they decided to take like data science and machine learning a little bit more seriously. So that's kind of when uh, um, me and my compatriots sort of got brought in, and we formed like the first you know machine learning slash data science team in 2017. But uh, luckily, in the last you know five or six years, WeWork has been collecting a lot of data, and it's only until now that they have like decided to actually start using it to like do stuff and be useful. So the interesting part about WeWork is that um, it is both a physical product and also has a significant digital uh, presence. So when you think of WeWork, you may not have heard of WeWork, but basically the main business model is like renting out office space to other companies. Uh, so there's like a physical co component there. We do have a lot of data on that side. So stuff like, um, like building data, like maintenance costs, things like that. Um, and we're basically trying to use it to optimize how we construct, maintain, and design our spaces. So things, these things would, might include things like uh, reducing extraneous costs from construction and building logistics, um, figuring out like, the exact number of conference rooms or like, you know, printers to put on each floor, um, and then sort of creating like, interior designs that try to encourage physical connections between our members. And then there, we also have a significant digital presence. So as a WeWork member, you have access to this application um, and like, member homepage. So on, in those two experiences, we focus mostly on helping people make connections digitally. Um, and some ways that we help do that is you know, helping people promote, promote the business, uh, requesting help from other members in the, in the building, or simply to make new friends and connections. So we started this team maybe a year and a half ago um, with just four people, uh, only two of which had any experience uh, pushing code. Um, and since then, we've grown to basically double our size. More people joined, more people who could push code joined. Um, and we're currently focused on a variety of different areas within the member experience realm. So it's a quick list of things that we've done uh, in the last year and a half. So we have a personalized news feed. We've got some text classifiers currently on the go. Uh, we're doing some entity extraction on member-generated content. We have some algorithms that are in use during the onboarding. Um, experience for members. Uh, we have a conference room recommender for some reason. And we also are building a, like an in-house experimentation platform. So it's basically just a custom built like A-B testing platform, which I feel like everybody does these days for some reason. Um, but this talk is uh, about something that is a little bit more experimental. Um, it's basically how to recommend members using graph embeddings, specifically this library that we discovered called note to vec So first I'll go over um, the business use case, then I'll kind of talk about some of the data that, we, that we're using, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the fun details of the model, which is probably what you all came for. So um, within WeWork, uh, and specifically our product area member experience, um, we're, there's this hypothesis that you know, members come to WeWork not just to have space, but also to meet other people, to expand their personal and professional networks. Um, so people are interested in meeting other members in the community, um, you know, just making friends if they're like in a new city, uh, making professional connections to help accelerate their careers or, you know, their business. And in general, there's this theory that people join WeWork because they want to feel a sense of belongingness. 
So thus, our team is interested in facilitating the meeting of members. And then that obviously begs the question, how do we create an intelligent member-to-member -member recommendation service? So before I talk about um, the model itself, I'll discuss some of the data that we can use. Uh, so this is embedded within a structure called the uh, Member Knowledge Graph, which is just kind of a fancy name, but actually it's pretty uh, straightforward. So basically, MKG is a central repository of information about our members. Um, so these would be things like member skills, uh, interests, events, and some other things that we're going to put, the, uh, put in the MKG later. So this is kind of a new uh, development. Um, and within the MKG, we are collecting data from a lot of different sources. So these include things like member profiles, uh, member interactions on the app. Uh, so we've like tracked posts that you like. We know the events that you've bookmarked or RSVP'd to. Um, we have this other data source called Community Team Notes, which is basically um, one of our community staff members will like manually enter in something that they've observed or learned about a member during like a real life conversation. And then we'll apply some entity extraction on those notes um, to harvest data about uh, more, more data about our members. And then we also have some external data sources that we can match to our internal data with you know, varying degrees of success. So this is just an example of what one of our profiles looks like. Um, and then we can mine both the structured uh, information, so the skills and interests, and then we can also apply some NLP techniques to this free form about me section. Um, so all this information can actually be conveniently expressed in graph form. Um, so as an example, take this, uh, this stock image of an Indonesian man. Um, we might surmise that this person is interested in sleeveless shirts, the color blue, laundry, and motorbikes. Um, and then if you look at another example of a person, um, this person might be interested in cell phones, jackets, and the color blue. And we can basically connect these members very naively and very, like, basically, using their shared interest in the color blue. So we can sort of extend this um, logic and connect multiple members through all of their shared uh, skills and interests. Um, so the assumption here is dead simple and that people who have lots of skills, shared skills or interests may be good rep recommendations for each other, which is obviously a very um, you know, flawed and uh, suboptimal representation of how people make friends in real life, but is good enough for this sort of first pass model. Um, so then we're interested in calculating how um, measures of member similarity using skills and interests, because that's one of our major data sources. Um, and for this part of the talk, I'll discuss embeddings briefly. Um, if you already know about embeddings, then you can just stop paying attention for the next couple of minutes. But just as a review, uh, embeddings have become this pretty popular topic uh, and method in the you know, machine learning uh, literature. So the original kind of embedding was basically for text. Um, you can think about things like glove. Um, if you become a member of WeWork, there are like diff different levels of membership. Mm -hmm. So like the most basic membership means that you get access to one building. So like one physical location. But then there are like other kinds of memberships where you can get like a key card that will give you access to lots of other buildings. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, word embeddings are kind of fun. Uh, it all kind of started with um, these guys who published a paper about word to vec um, That was like 10 years ago, I think. So essentially the idea is that um, we, we can actually train neural net models to learn re vector representations of words that sort of encode their inherent semantic meaning. So once you train your model, um, you can sort of extract all the weights of that neural net and use them as ways to represent words. So each word basically becomes represented by an n-dimensional vector after you get your word embeddings. So that's kind of fun. And ultimately, the result of this model can be used for a lot of interesting NLP tasks, like word similarity, clustering, and classification. So we're basically going to take that same intuition that we have for word embeddings and kind of transport that to another kind of data structure, which is graph networks. So graph networks are fun um, and relevant to WeWork because you can represent um, you know, communities of WeWork members with these graph networks. 
And instead of words, we'll have nodes. And each node in the network can be represented with a vector after training a very similar kind of neural network model. So suppose that we're in Westeros and we want to create social net graphs of all the characters in Game of Thrones. Um, so you might see here that a lot of the characters have interacted with each other in some way. Um, and in this graph, every node represents one of the um, Game of Thrones characters. Something that's kind of fun is that you can create edges between two distinct nodes. Um, through a using a variety of different functions. Um, so naturally, you can create edges uh, if you just measure like how many times a character has like talked or appeared in the same scene with another character. But you can also create ca edges in some more artificial ways. So you can create edges as a function of similarities between two people's skill sets. Um, so maybe uh, you know John, John Snow, and Mance Raider could be connected because they're really good at killing people. So that's like a shared similarity that they have. Um, and then you can apply this logic to lots of other different kinds of characteristics. Um, so once you have your node embeddings, the nodes with similar vectors uh, should be clustered close together if you measure by something like cosine similarity. Um, so luckily, someone's already written a paper about this and sort of uh, you know, formalized this logic. Um, these two guys from Stanford uh, published a paper maybe a couple years ago called Note to Vec, Scalable Feature Learning for Networks. And not only have they published this lovely paper, but they also released a, a Python package that conveniently we can use in, uh, and uh, leverage in our own work. So next I'll go over the differences between Wartovec and Notovec. Um, so for Wartovec, very briefly, given some corpus, you can maximize the probability of observing the next word conditional on the context words that are around that word. Um, so that's kind of the basic optimization problem that you're trying to solve. And this particular architecture is known as continuous bag of words, or CBOW. Conversely, you also have this skip gram architecture, which I think is actually more used, where you basically um, do the inverse of the CBOW problem, where you try to predict the context words given the target word that you're currently on. So that's word to vec. Um, note to vec is a little bit similar. So for note to vec, we want to maximize the log probability of observing a network neighborhood for any given node, a U, conditioned on its feature representation. So we're trying to solve this problem. Um, and in order to make this problem mathematically tractable, we can make two assumptions, uh, which will sort of simplify the math a little bit. So the first assumption would be assuming conditional independence of neighborhood nodes. Um, and the second assumption is assuming uh, there's symmetry in feature space, such that a, net a source node and a neighborhood node have a symmetric effect over each other. Um, so then you have the situation where the conditional likelihood of every node pair can be written as a softmax function, uh, very similar to the optimization function for, for Wartovec, actually. Um, so then with these two assumptions, you can basically do a lot of like algebra and represent the original function as this, um, this second equation, which is a lot more tractable. Um, so then if we know the representation for node V, which is the grade node in the middle, then we should be able to predict its neighborhood x1, x2, and x3 with some probability. So one of the problems that immediately comes up is that there's no obvious way to identify separate neighborhoods in a graph in the same way that you might identify sentences in a document. So if you have a document, uh, it's kind of natural to separate all the sentences in the document by using linguistic features, grammar, uh, punctuation, things like that. Um, so you can actually just chop it up into individual sentences. But there's not really a good way to do that in a graph network because a graph can contain basically an infinite number of subgraphs. Um, so the solution here is to simulate as many random walks around each node to define possible neighborhoods around the node. So in this way, we're kind of creating um, sentences artificially for use in the algorithm. Um, so every walk, every random walk, in, is essentially a directed subgraph, which could be analogous to a sentence in a text corpus. So once we have um, all, these, all these random walks, we can actually use them as training data. Um, and then we can put it into a standard word vec model, which is actually what the, library, the Python library does. So from the graph on the left, we can create multiple potential neighborhoods for each target node, and then um, use them to basically train the neural network, and then get the embeddings from there. Um, one interesting feature is that you can actually tune a couple of different hyperparameters. 
Um, so in order to efficiently explore many possible neighborhoods of this particular node, uh, you can use these two parameters, P and Q, in order to define what the random walk simulation looks like. So essentially, um, these two parameters will determine how locally or how globally the walk explores a neighborhood of the target node. So um, high P typically leads to uh, a lesser likelihood of revisiting an already visited node, and a high value of Q is generally correlated with um, the random walk being more likely to visit close by nodes. So the reason um, we have these two hyperparameters in the first place is that we want this random walk algorithm to be able to emulate different sampling strategies. So um, there's two like basic kinds of searches you can do. Uh, breadth first search is when the neighborhood is restricted to immediate neighborhoods of the node U. And depth first search is when the neighborhood consists of nodes that are sampled at increasing distances from you. Um, so this is actually supposed to represent these two like uh, different philosophies of how, uh, how networks form in graphs. So the first sort of like school of thought is that a lot of you know, similar nodes should be clustered together, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and the second school of thought posits that uh, nodes that are like very similar to each other should actually be, or actually serve similar purposes within different subgraphs. So if you have like three nodes that serve as sort of the center of their respective um, you know, clusters of nodes, then you can make an argument that these three nodes share a lot of similarities with each other. Um, but anyway, so ultimately the uh, node to vec algorithm can be decomposed in three uh, distinct steps. So this first step is to pre-compute transition probabilities for the random walk simulation. Um, the second step is for every node, we simulate our random walks at fixed length L. And then lastly, we'll feed the random walks into a word to vec model and then solve it with uh, gradient descent. Um, and so once we train a model and find embeddings for each node, we can do a lot of fun things like clustering, node classification, link prediction, and some community detection. Um, so in our particular use case for WeWork, uh, for each location that we have, we can run node to vec on a social graph using the data in our member knowledge graph and then map every member within that building to its own vector. And then we can do things like, you know, very basically uh, retrieving the most similar members for each member. Um, so this, uh, this algorithm can be used to power different kinds of member recommendations. And uh, currently we have two um, distinct use cases that we're interested in trying out that we're currently prototyping. Uh, so the first use case is just general member recommendation, specifically during the onboarding process. So there's some research that's been done that sort of claimed that um, the first you know, couple of weeks of a member's tenure at WeWork are really important in determining you know, how long that member stays, when they're gonna churn, and how much they'll enjoy the experience. So we wanna be able to like, immediately you know, introduce a potential mem uh, one of these new members to members in the community that they might be able to connect with. So we can run this algorithm during their onboarding process, quickly retrieve uh, you know, skills and interests that they put in <laughs> during onboarding, and then sort of at the end of the process, we can you know, surface three or four members that we think they might like to meet. So then we have a second use case, which is a little bit more um, specific. So within WeWork, uh, there's a lot of different business lines, and one of the business lines is this um, like startup incubator that we have, it's called WeWork Labs. So within this uh, incubator, most of the members are like very, um, you know, interested in meeting other members, meeting other entrepreneurs, because they're all like people who want to start their own companies. So they all kind of share this common interest and common uh, drive to use, to use the WeWork uh, network in order to you know, help them get their companies off the ground. Um, so we can actually use this algorithm to basically suggest labs members to connect with, and then we can also leverage our staff members, our community team, to actually facilitate these introductions in person so that there's like a higher likelihood of them actually connecting. Um, so we're currently piloting these two um, use cases using the node to vec algorithm. Oh yeah, and that's all I got. So thanks for listening. No, I, I, I heard you. Um, yeah, we ran some tests. Uh, so basically this paper uh, that we used 
uh, introduced like tests you could run, like empirical studies. So we basically emulated some of their tests in the way they like uh, created these link prediction tasks. So we basically took that and ran this model against like a control model, and we did see some improvements in the link prediction uh, accuracy. But currently, we don't have any like member recommendation algorithms currently running in prod that actually like affect the member experience right now. So this is like a new new thing that we're trying to roll out. Does that answer your question? Uh, once you have embeddings, you can do a lot of things with them. So clustering would be one of those applications. And the view tables, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Do you have a way to grab and use or reuse the weight to expand the flexibility? Yeah, yeah. So you can, def the, the flexibility comes from being able to define your edges in a way that you think makes sense and reflects the particular details of your business problem. So if you think that certain interactions count more than others, then you can certainly include weights in order to create those edge values. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like for us, maybe we don't care about you know, people liking someone else's post on our social network, but we care more about like, if they actually message each other directly. Have, have you looked at whether it makes a difference in weights versus? Uh, we did some initial testing, um, and then all of our weights were kind of based on the empirical distribution of like, distinct interactions on the network. Yeah, so we basically like did, did a frequency count of like how many times, you know, how often did a member make, an, make a message to another member versus just commenting on a member's post. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So a classical way I would think of to uh, create vector from a graph would be mm -hmm. taking the graph and extracting some uh, graph feature like density mm -hmm. of uh, betweenness or entropy, mm -hmm. yeah. not triangle one. Yeah. Not I can create an n-dimensional vector because yeah. I choose n uh, graph properties. Yeah. So it's a form of n-bending in some sense, but it's a more classical way to do it. Did, did you compare? Uh, so you, are you think, mentioning things? Are you referring to things like eigenvector, no, no, eigenvector no, no. centrality, if, or things like I that? If I give you a graph, yeah, right, you can count the number of neighbor. Yeah. You can. There's something called betweenness, is uh, which yeah. node is the most important? Yeah. Yeah. Triangle, yeah. entropy, because they're, they're depending of how much uh, mm -hmm. that business you do. It's it's all kind of a cla classical. Yeah, like uh, graph, graph features that you use in and social network analysis. If I extract, I mean, you can define like mm -hmm. an infinite number, mm -hmm. you know, but if I extract n of them, mm -hmm. it gives me an n-dimensional vector yeah. for each each node as uh, this n-dimensional feature. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question. I w I'm wondering how does it compare to if, or if something you um, Yeah, like I think th that's a really good start, um, but it involves a lot of like manual <laughs> feature processing because you have to like define you know each feature. You have to like write the code to like calculate the value of, of that feature for each node or each edge. Yeah. So there's a lot of like you know manual work that has to be done. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. I mean there are like yeah. libraries. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so for words of X, my understanding is you need a certain number of data points for it to, you know, to capture some, some information, and then yeah. there's always, the, I guess, the size of the, the embedding itself, how large you want to make it. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like, uh, what, what's the minimum amount of data that you need to get meaningful results? And also, you mentioned the edges. I assume you can have multiple type of edge relationships yeah. to make that vocabulary or that ontology richer, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about word to vec or node to vec? Node to vec, node to vec. Uh, so we've run this on, like, so typically our buildings are anywhere from like 300 people to like 1,000, 2,000, or yeah, let's, let's say like 1,500 is like you know, top like, you know, 5%. Um, so this algorithm works pretty well around like the 700 to like 800 person range. Um, it probably does a lot better if you add more members, but at that point, they, uh, it becomes a lot really expensive to compute. So actually, we're having trouble. So we like basically run it on like a like a remote machine, but it does take a long time because it's not been like optimized. The code is not optimized. So there's like apparently um, a Spark Im implementation, but the original author of the package started it and then basically just dropped it, as academics are wont to do. Hmm? Hey, so um, it sounds like. 
uh, whenever you were describing the different kinds of problems that uh, your team was solving, mm -hmm. um, it seemed kind of uh, very general. There are a lot of different problems. How do you guys, the data science team, construct like the actual use cases that you guys are going to solve? Does that come, where does that planning come in? Um, so it's mostly, I would say that, like most of it is uh, kind of dictated by various like senior level people and like product directors. They're like, oh, we should be focused on this because we've noticed that like members are, you know, complaining about it or like there's like member feedback. There's, like some hypothesis that like doing X will, you know, lower member dissatisfaction. So then we have to like basically work with that, you know, general feeling, um, and then create some sort of solution that will solve that will address it. Okay, and then in addition to like matching, making sure like the algorithms you use match that objective function, the business objective function you're trying yeah. to capture. So like uh, people connecting, there's kind of like our two people very similar to each other, mm -hmm. but then there's kind of like our two people complementary. Yeah. How does the algorithm you're using address both of those? Um, it definitely, it just depends on the edges that you construct and what sort of data you feed into it. Um, for now, we're just relying on similarity uh, because we haven't really figured out a good way to define what complementary means. So that is a uh, definition. That's like a task that we haven't yet gotten to. Yeah. How are you planning to validate that your model actually achieves its business purpose? Um, so we can look at, so for the two use cases I discussed, um, the easier one would just be to rely on our community team members and then kind of follow up, them, follow up with them to determine whether or not these two members actually you know, met with each other and if they actually enjoy that interaction. So there's like manual feedback we can collect um, through our labs members. And then for the other use case, the onboarding flow, we can basically look at, you know, are these, um, are these recommendations being accepted in some way? Like, are they like clicking through on this person's profile to learn more about the person because they were like, their interest got piqued by the recommendations. That makes sense? Yeah. So we can collect both like online information um, through the app that we have and also some offline feedback based off our, uh, you know, our observations um, from our community team, community team members. Awesome. All right. I've given you two minutes back.